Hi and welcome again to these videos on structural dynamics. So when systems cannot be reduced to a single degree of freedom system, one has to go into the more complicated mathematics of multiple degrees of freedom systems. If we consider the car, we saw in the chapter on single degree of freedom systems that you can consider the motion as vertical and then replace the body of the car by a rigid mass and the suspensions by a spring. Now in reality, if you look in two dimensions, this uh, car can also uh, rotate. And so you can make a slightly more complex model by considering the rigid car, the two flexible suspensions on each side, and then the wheels as rigid but the connection between the wheels and the road, which is the tire, as flexible. In this case, you now have the possibility to have both the vertical motion and the rotation of the body of the car. Another example is the one that we saw for building. So if you stack on top of each other different levels, you can replace the system by a set of masses and springs where the stiffness represents the flexibility of the columns and the mass is the mass of each rigid floor. So you will have as many masses and stiffnesses as there are degrees of freedom, as there are levels in the building. So multiple degrees of freedom systems can be represented by masses connected to each other with springs. But how do you solve the equations of motions for such systems? Now we will use this simple example with two masses and three springs to illustrate how you compute response of multiple degree of freedom systems. Um, in this example we need to write the uh, equations of motion by applying Newton's law to each of the masses. So for the first mass, M1, you see that there is one force due to the compression of the spring here, which is expressed by minus Kx1. And the second force is related to the spring contents as well, constant, as well as the relative displacement between mass 2 and mass 1. So if mass 2 and mass 1 are moving with the same amount of displacement, there is no compression or stretching of, of the spring, so no force applied. For mass 2, you have the same, so you have one force of the spring related to the relative motion between x1 and x2. You have one uh, spring force due to the displacement here, so kx2, and then you have the force applied to the body. So always pay attention to the sign of these expressions, for example here. To know the sign of this first term, what you can do is you can just block x1, so consider that x1 is not moving, and just then do a motion of x2. So if you do a positive change of x2, you will see that mass, moves, mass 2 moves down while mass 1 doesn't move. And so the force will now be in the opposite direction of motion because x is here considered uh, downwards. So the equations of motion can be rewritten in a matrix form. We take the form here. So you have one matrix times a vector of accelerations and one matrix times a vector of displacement and here a force vector. So the general notation for that is a mass matrix M times an acceleration vector X plus a stiffness matrix K multiplied by the distance vector is equal to a force vector. The free response is computed as in the case of the single degree of freedom by considering that the right hand side, so the force is zero. We also take uh, the form of the response as shown here. So x1 and x2 are represented by an amplitude a1 or a2 multiplied by e to the power of rt. This vector a1, a2 is called psi 
And if we replace in the equation, we find here a matrix equation where you have k plus r square m times i is equal to zero. Now we know from algebra that this equation, this set of equation, will admit a non-trivial solution, so a non-zero solution for psi, only if the determinant of the matrix is zero. Because we know that k and m are positive and definite matrices, we know that r square is negative, so we replace it by minus omega square, so that now we have to solve the equation k minus omega square m psi is equal to zero. Now this is called a generalized eigenvalue problem where the eigenvalue is minus omega square. So we know that the determinant of k minus omega square m will be zero and if the system has n degrees of freedom, there will exist n values of minus omega square for which this equation is satisfied. And these are the n eigenvalues, which in dynamics are called eigenfrequencies. To these eigenfrequencies are associated eigenvectors psi, and they are called mode shapes. Now, the general solution for the free response can be written as a sum of free responses of one degree of freedom systems. So you will recognize here the cosine and sine term with some coefficients in front. But you have also a summation over the number of degrees of freedom of these functions of times multiplied by the mode shapes. There is a very interesting property which is called the orthogonality of the mode shapes. Let's discuss that in a little more detail, what these equations mean. So if we take the equation, the generalized eigenvalue problem, and we plug in one of the solutions, solution i, with uh, the frequency, angular frequency, omega i square, and the mode shape psi i. We take the same equation, but for a different mode, so where omega i is different from omega j. If we pre-multiply the first equation by phi psi j transposed and the second equation by psi i transposed and if we subtract, taking into account the symmetry of k, so psi i transpose k psi j is equal to psi j transpose k psi i and same for m, then we end up with these equations which it must be equal to zero and as we know that i is different from j then we know that this term here must be equal to zero. So this proves that if you take two mode shapes psi j and psi i you do this matrix product so vector j transpose psi j transpose multiplied by m multiplied by psi i you will have zero if i is different from j. Now, if i is equal to j, then this is non-zero and we call this product mu i, which is the modal math. So that you can write, in general, that psi i transpose m psi j is equal to delta i j times mu i, where delta i j is the uh, Kronecker delta. In order to prove the second orthogonality condition, we take again the initial equation and now we are going to pre-multiply this equation by psi i transpose and take into account this equation so that we end up with the second orthogonality condition which shows that these mode shapes are also orthogonal with respect to the matrix k and that the product gives you delta i j mu i multiplied by omega i squared. If we use matrix notations, you can define the matrix of mode shapes capital Psi by making a matrix and putting each of the mode shapes or so each of the vectors here as columns in a large matrix. So this will be an n by n matrix and the, the products expressed here can be written by a matrix product and the result when you use m in the middle will give you a diagonal matrix with the modal masses on the diagonal 
and for k it will give you modal masses multiplied by omega i squared. So there are two main differences between single degree of freedom systems and multiple degree of freedom systems. The first one is that for multiple degrees of freedom systems you have several natural frequencies. The second one is that associated to these natural frequencies are mode shapes. We illustrate the computation of the free response for the two degree of freedom system with two masses and three springs. So we have these equations of motion and now we look at k minus omega square m psi is equal to zero. So we know that the k matrix is given by this, the m by this. So if we compute this determinant, this is the determinant of this expression and the determinant of this expression is given by the following expression, which can be simplified as you see here. So now this is a fourth order equation, but actually there are um, only even powers of omega. So you can replace the variable uh, by uh, um, a substitute one so that you have a second order equation in omega square. And the two solutions here, when you solve for the second order equation, are omega 1 square is equal to k over m and omega 2 square is 3k over m. Now, if you want to compute the associated mode shapes, you need to replace in the equation of motion by the value of the specific value of omega. So for the first mode, we replace omega 1 square is equal to k over m in this uh, equation and we take psi is equal to a1 and a2. So this gives us the following equation and as this simplifies to k a1 we find that a1 is equal to a2 for the first mode shape. For the second one we take the first line here, we have 2k minus omega 2 square, which is 3k over m times a1 minus k times a2 is equal to 0. And in this case, we find that a1 is equal to minus a2. Now, this means that the two mode shapes can be represented by psi 1 is equal to 1, 1 and psi 2 is equal to 1 minus 1 because this satisfies a1 is equal to a2 and a1 is equal to minus a2. But in fact you could also use 2 2 or 10 10 or any value. This is because mode shapes don't really have a scaling and the reason for that is, simple, is simply that if you look at this equation if you multiply the vector here by any value by any value you will always get zero. So any multiplication of a mode shape, any mode shape multiplied by a constant value is still a mode shape. So here we decided to take values of one and one. What does it represent physically? It means physically that the first mode in the first mode masses one and two are moving in the same direction and of the same amplitude for that mode. For the second mode, however, they are moving of the same, same amplitude, but in opposite directions. So let's look at that in a small animation. This is mode one, where the two masses are moving of the same amplitude and in the same direction. And this is mode two, where they are moving in the same amplitude, but opposite directions. If you want to compute the free response, we saw that it will be a combination of time functions of the different frequencies in the system. So here we have omega 1 and omega 2 with a cosine and a sine uh, contribution. And for the first part here that is dependent on omega 1, it will, multiply, it will be multiplied by the first mode shape, while for the second one it is multiplied by the second mode shape. If we assume that the two masses are at, at rest, so with zero velocity in the beginning, and if we impose a displacement of one of the masses, so we block mass one and we just pull on mass two to have a displacement of, let's say, one millimeter, uh, 
Then you can solve this equate and you will find x1 of that form and x2 of that form. So, so graphically, this is how x1 will be. So it starts from zero and then starts to oscillate. While for mass two, you start from one millimeter and then start oscillating. What you see compared to the one degree of freedom system is that now you have a combination of two frequencies in the response. So multiple degree of freedom system have several resonant frequencies and to each of these is associated a mode shape. And the reason why it's so important in dynamics, it's because as we will see later, when you excite a system at a frequency that is close to that resonance, the motion of the system will correspond to this specific mode shapes. So let's illustrate that first with a movie. So we see here a system where three masses are linked together with springs to the ground. And there is a base motion that is applied where the frequency is increasing. So you see here that it's starting to hit the first resonance, which is at 435, 4.35 hertz. And you see that in this case, the three masses are in phase and moving in the same direction for that frequency. Now the motion decreases, which means that we are leaving the first resonance and we are still increasing the frequency. And now we are going to hit the second resonance. So you're starting to see that the second mass in the middle is barely moving while the top mass and the bottom mass are in uh, opposition. So one is moving to the left while the other one is moving to the right. So this becomes more obvious how we are approaching the second natural frequency of the system. Multiple degree of freedom systems have several natural frequencies and mode shapes which only depend on the physical parameters of stiffness and mass. So let's look now at their response under harmonic excitation. To solve for the displacement of this two degree of freedom system due to harmonic excitation, we make the assumption that x of t is written as capital X times T e to the power of I omega T and same kind of assumption with F of T. Then by replacing, we get the equation K minus omega square M X is equal to F, where F is the applied force. Now, how can we compute the response to, to this harmonic uh, excitation? If we take this two degree of freedom system, this is what the equations uh, look like. And it's quite simple in that case to find that x1 over f is given by this. And so on the denominator, you see that if this is zero, you will have resonance. And actually they correspond exactly to the resonance that we have computed before for the free response. Now for x2 over f, you see that you have the same resonances but on the numerator, you have something special is that this numerator can come to zero if 2k minus omega square m is equal to zero. So at a specific frequency, omega is equal to square root of 2k over m, you will have an anti-resonance. This is what it looks like. So x1 over have f will have two resonances and x2 over f will have these two resonances plus an anti-resonance. So this is a frequency at which there will be no motion of x2. But of course, x1 will be moving because you see that at the same frequency, you have some motion here on x1. It's important to understand that natural frequencies are global properties of structures, which means that 
if you measure the motion at different position, you will always see a resonant frequency in the transfer function. Anti-resonances are, however, local properties. As you saw here in the two mass systems, only one of the transfer functions presents an anti-resonance. Mode shapes have a physical meaning, but they are also very useful from the mathematical point of view, as we will see next. The projection in the modal basis consists in writing x of t as a sum over the mode shapes of modal amplitudes zi of t times the mode shapes. In a matrix notation, this gives x is equal to the matrix of mode shapes psi multiplied by the modal amplitude vector z. So if we replace that in an equation of motion, this is what we get. Then we pre-multiply by psi transpose and we get this expression. Now we use the orthogonality conditions. So this product is equal to a diagonal matrix with mu i on the diagonal. And this product is equal to a diagonal matrix with mu i omega i square on the diagonal. And because they are, these are diagonal, it means that this corresponds to a set of n independent equations of the type mu i z i i second derivative plus mu i omega i square z i is equal to f i. This means that the solution can be obtained so the full solution x of t can be obtained by solving independ independently for zi and each zi is an equation, is the solution of the equation of a sing single degree of freedom system where the mass is the modal mass mu i, the stiffness is mu i omega i square the natural frequency is omega i, the angular one, and the frequency is therefore uh, given with a factor of 2 pi. And the fourth, the modal excit excitation, is given by psi i transpose f. So the fourth will be different for each mode. Now that we have transformed the equations of motion into a set of n independent equations which correspond to the equation of motion of a single degree of freedom system, we can use all the tools that we have learned before to solve for the, the response. Let's look at that, for example, for harmonic excitation. We can also solve for harmonic excitation by considering that the modal amplitude is given by zi times e to the power of i omega t, and in this case, x is written as a function of the frequency as a combination of modal amplitudes that depend on the frequency times the mode shapes. So in the matrix notation, this is what we have. And the equations of motion are like this, where you see that by using the orthogonality conditions, again, on these two uh, factors, you obtain the following Problem. So you will have the first matrix which has mu i omega i square on the diagonal, the second one has mu i on the diagonal, there is a minus omega square here, and you see that you just need to solve for modal amplitudes with some modal excitation. So each line is independent of the other because there is no extra diagonal terms, and you can solve simply for z i with the following expression. So this is the solution of a single degree of freedom oscillator without damping. And when you want to build uh, the solution for in the physical domain, so for the physical displacement x, it is a combination of these responses zi of omega times the mode shapes, which is expressed as this. So it means that x will be the combination of single degree of freedom oscillator responses at different frequencies. Let's illustrate that on a two degree of freedom system. We know that the mode shapes are given by 1, 1 and 1, minus 1. So we can calculate the product 
psi transpose m psi, which should be diagonal, and indeed it is, and gives you 2m on the diagonal uh, of the matrix, so that mu1 and mu2 are in this case equal, and are equal to 2 times the mass. The modal excitation can be computed, and so you see the first mode will be excited by f, and the second one by minus f. So let's take f equal to 1 to have a unit response. Then we find that z1 is equal to this expression, where we have replaced omega uh, 1 by k over m. And here, for the second one, we have omega uh, 2, which is 3k over m. So if we now look at the response on the first degree of freedom, so x1 of omega, you see that you have these expressions multiplied by the mode shapes, where in this case, the value of the mode shape on the first degree of freedom is 1 for the first mode shape and 1 for the second mode shape. So I remind you that we, we computed analytically this response. And actually, if you rearrange the terms in the denominator, you will see that it's exactly the same. So we have the exact same solution, but we have here decomposition in two mode shapes and two independent single degree of freedom system. This is interesting because you can see the contribution of each of the terms to the total response. So the contribution of mode 1 here is a single degree of freedom uh, response with a natural frequency f1. And what we know is that if we look at the phase of mode 1, before resonance, the phase is zero. So x and f are in phase because you see here that the numerator has a positive value. And we know that after resonance, there is a shift of 180 degrees. So they are out of phase. For the second contribution, we see that in the numerator, we have a negative value. So that when you start at zero frequency, you will have a 180 degree out of phase. Then, after the second resonance, there will be a change of phase. And so if you look in the middle here, you see that the two uh, contributions have the same phase, so one, uh, 180 degrees. This is written in radians per second, so uh, in radians, sorry, so this is uh, a pi, 3.14. And so because they have the same phase, when they add together, they just give the double of the value. Of course, on the graph, it doesn't look like double because this is a logarithmic scale. Now for the second mass, if we look at the second line now, you see that there is a change of sign for the second mode because it is minus one and one. So we can make the same reasoning as before, but now you see that the phase of the second contribution here will be uh, opposite will be different by 180 degrees. And so what happens is that between the two frequencies now, the two contributions at this point are equal in amplitude, but they are opposite in phase. And so when you sum them together, it's like a constant minus a constant. So it gives zero because you have same amplitude and opposite phase. And that, what, that is what leads to anti-resonance. Of course, as for one degree of freedom systems, there is always dissipation in multiple degree of freedom systems. When you introduce damping in the system in the form of dashpots, you see that there are additional terms in the equation of motion. And these additional terms here can be represented by a damping matrix C multiplied by a velocity vector x dot. Now if we look at the free response and consider again that x1 and x2 can be written as uh, psi times e to the power of rt, then we get the following characteristic equations and which admit a non-trivial solution only if the determinant is zero. Now because of the presence of the rc term, the roots are complex. And this means that it will lead to oscillatory functions with exponential envelope as for the one degree of freedom system. But it will also lead to complex eigenvectors, so complex mode shapes,
which are actually not often used in practice in vibrations. So rather than using these complex mode shapes, the idea is to project the equations of motion on the real mode shape. So you know that the real mode shapes are the solution of the following equation. And now, if you want to project, you assume that x of t can be written as a sum over the n mode shapes of zi of t, which is the modal amplitude, times psi i, which is the mode shape, or in matrix notation, x is equal to psi times z. If we do that, as we did for the undamped case, we see that a new term appears, which is the damping term. Now, in general, this term is, doesn't lead to a diagonal matrix and the equations remain coupled. But in some cases, like the Rayleigh damping, which states that C is equal to alpha K plus beta M, so taking this kind of representation of C, will lead to a diagonal matrix when you pre-multiply and post-multiply by the matrix of mode shapes. In fact, if you compute this product, you see that it leads to a diagonal matrix where on the diagonal you have alpha mu i omega i square plus beta mu i. This is often used as a simplifying assumption to decouple the equations of motion, but it does not have a physical meaning. There is no reason why the damping would be proportional to k and m. So another assumption is uh, most often used, which is the modal damping. And this is that when the damping is small, the off-diagonal terms can be neglected. And so we only keep the terms on diagonal and we define these terms as 2, two mu i psi i omega i. Why do we do that? Because in this case, the psi i is the modal damping of mode i and corresponds to the damping coefficient that we define for the one degree of freedom system. So the projection on the real mode shapes leads to equations of the following type, which are actually n independent equations of the type mu i z i i dot dot plus 2 mu i xi i omega i z i dot plus mu i omega i square z i is equal to f i. So we recognize again that this is the equation of motion of a damped single degree of freedom with a mass mu i, a stiffness mu i omega i square, a damping coefficient xi i, a natural frequency omega i, and a modal force f i. There is a link between the Rayleigh and the modal damping because if you equate the two diagonal matrices um, of Rayleigh damping and of modal damping, you see that the, the modal damping is given by for the Rayleigh factors by Xi i is one half alpha omega i plus beta over omega i. So what it means is graphically is that if you have, for example, several natural frequencies on the frequency axis, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, and omega 4, the corresponding psi values are computed with these equations. And here for typical values of alpha and beta, you see that there is a term that depends, depends linearly on omega i. So when omega i is large, it will tend to a line. And there is a term depending on 1 over omega i. So when, uh, when omega i is small, this term becomes large. This is the part, this part of the equation. So only two parameters, alpha and beta, are used to define the damping of all modes. So of course you cannot match reality because in reality these psi values do not follow such a curve. So you tend to overestimate the damping at low frequencies and at very high frequencies. And it can represent accurately the damping of two modes only because you have two parameters so you can match two values on the curve. We saw that even when there is damping, it's possible to project the equations of motion on the basis of the real mode shapes and still obtain n independent equations to solve. Let's illustrate that with our two degree of freedom system.
If we look at the equations of motions of the two degree of freedom system under harmonic excitation, it leads to the following equation k plus i omega c minus omega square m x is equal to f. Now we can solve this by replacing the equations k and m by their values and c as well. And for a two degree of freedom system, it's possible to write that analytically, which leads to the following. We see now that uh, there are damped resonances. So because of the term in the damping, it never goes to infinity for a given value of frequency. Also, the anti-resonance is not strict in the sense that there is no frequency omega that is real and cancels the numerator. If we look at the response, in black it's for a value of b is equal to 0.01 newton per meter second and as we increase the damping we see that the two peaks are going down as we saw for the Wandoff system. Note however that the second peak appears more damp than the first one and we will come back to that just a few slides later. Uh, we can also solve these equations using the solution in the modal basis using the real mode shape. So you do, we do the following projection. We come to this equation. Then we do the modal damping hypothesis considering that the damping is small. And so each zj can be solved for independently give, leading to this, the following expression so that the solution can be written as a sum over j is equal to 1 to n of responses in the frequency domain of damped single degree of freedom oscillators. So graphically it means that the solution x of w will be the sum of uh, the contribution of mode 1 which has a damped resonance at frequency f1 and the contribution of mode 2, which has a damped resonance with a different value of Xi at frequency F2. Now, if we come back to our two degree of freedom system and we project in the, the modal basis, we need now to compute uh, the product Psi transpose C Psi. And we see here that because it is a very particular case where the, the C matrix is proportional to the k matrix. Remember that the k matrix is 2k minus k minus k 2k. So there is a proportional factor between the two. We are in the case of Rayleigh damping where beta is zero and so it leads to a di diagonal matrix. The value of b can, uh, of xi can be extracted from these diagonal terms leading to xi i is b over 2 square root of km and xi 2 is actually equal to square root of 3 times xi 1. So we see that indeed the damping of mode 2 is higher by a factor of square root of 3 than uh, Xi1. For the values of damping that we considered before, this leads to values uh, of Xi is equal to 0.5% and 0.9 for the second one and 2 and 3.5 for a higher value and the highest value is 10 and 17.3%. Note that you can intuitively understand why the damping is higher on mode 2. If you look at mode 1, remember that the two masses are moving here in phase so that the spring here is not uh, compressed or, or in traction. Which means that if you put a dashpot here, it will not dissipate energy because it is not uh, stretched. In mode 2, however, you see that there is energy, strain energy in all the three springs so it's likely that there will be more energy dissipated in the second mode. Let's discuss now the validity of this modal damping hypothesis. So in the previous example, the B matrix was proportional to the K matrix, but if we remove one of the dampers, it will not be the case anymore. So this is now the new damping matrix, and you see that if you neglect the off-diagonal terms, this is what you will get when computing Psi transpose C Psi, which is not diagonal. 
This gives the following values of, of damping factors. And now we can compare the exact solution, the one that we did analytically first, so in the uh, dotted line, and the modal damping response in the full line. What you see is that for small via values of dampings, the two curves match exactly. But if you go to higher values of damping, you see that you start having a difference between the two curves. Note also that on all curves, you have a slight difference at anti-resonance. So it means that the modal damping hypothesis is valid when the damping is small, typically less than 10%, and if you are away from the anti-resonance. We can also look at the impulse response. So we know that x of t, uh, when you project on the modal basis, is the sum of zi times psi i. And now we can compute the response zi to an impulse. So this is because we know that zi is excited with the force, modal force fi. We can just multiply it by the impulse response, which is done here. So when you apply an impulse to a multiple degree of freedom system, you will see, for example, here at the first natural frequency with its given damping coefficient, an impulse response. At the second frequency, you will have this one. And when you sum the two, this is the result that you have. Note that even if the damping factors are equivalent on the two impulse responses, the second one, the highest frequency, will decay faster because the term is, the decay factor is minus psi i omega i. So the larger omega i, the faster is decay. So in the end, in the beginning of the total impulse response, you have an interaction between the two modes. But at the end, as you reach those uh, time values, you see that this has completely disappeared and we have only the first mode response. Um, we can also look at the impulse of, uh, at the impact of the values of damping. So you see here that the more damping you put in the system, the fastest the response decays, such as in the one of system example. We can now use also Duhamel's integral because we have decoupled the equations of motion. So we can solve in the time domain for each mode and then recombine. So for example, here, if we use an excitation below the two resonance frequencies, so here omega, the excitation frequency is 0 0.3 times the first natural frequency of my system. I do a convolution with the total impulse response uh, containing the two mode shapes. And this is what we get. So you recognize the transient regime after which you have some established steady state regime. If you excite between the two resonance frequency, here we take, for example, omega 1 plus omega 2 divided by 2, you convolute with the impulse response, and this is what you get. So you see clearly in the transient regime the presence of uh, the two natural frequencies, probably plus the excitation frequency, and then the steady state regime at the excitation frequency after some time. If you excite above the second natural frequency, so here 1.2 times omega 2, and you convolute, you see again that there is a transient regime where the amplitude is actually higher than in the steady state regime, and then the steady state regime. Now lastly, if we look at sine sweep excitation, we're going to sweep the frequency from 0 to here uh, 2.8 radians per second. So this is actually the time domain representation, but I have replaced the time scale by a frequency scale to tell you when you are reaching which frequency in the changing frequency of the sign here. So I'm sweeping from 0 to above the second natural frequency. We convolute the input signal with the impulse response, and this is the motion of mass 2. So you see clearly the two resonances when the frequency of the sine excitation matches one of the two natural frequencies of the Tudov system.
The last topic we need to address is the response of a multiple degree of freedom system to base excitation. The last case we are looking at is base excitation. So if we consider now a system with two masses, two springs and two dash pots that's excited by its base with a motion x0, this is the forces applied to the bodies so that the equations of motion reduce to these expressions. Now again, we're going to use relative motion as um, the variable for the motion described here with respect to the motion of the base. And by doing that, this is what the equations of motion become, which can be written in a matrix notation. Note that the matrices correspond to the system here where you have fixed the degree of freedom uh, x0, so the base. And the force vector is given by minus m times the acceleration of the base. Those matrix notations um, are defined with relative motion with respect to the basis and the x dot dot b, so the acceleration of the basis, is defined by a matrix T multiplied by a value of base excitation. So the T expands this value of x0 dot dot on the two degrees of freedom here. So if you do that, you see that this is the same problem as with force excitation. So everything we have done before can apply. It means that, for example, if you want to compute the response of this two degree of freedom system to an earthquake, you need to have, of course, the input force, which is here the acceleration of the ground. So this is the x dot dot zero that was recorded for the Santa Cruz earthquake in 1990. You compute the impulse response to the forces um, that are actually now on the two masses, the equivalent force on the two masses. And then from there, you have a system here. We set the values to correspond to the excitation frequency of the earthquake. So we have a first frequency at 3.11 Hertz, the second one at 8.14 Hertz. Damping values are about 2 and 5 percent. And this is the response when you convolute the base acceleration with the impulse response. Uh, this is the relative motion of the second floor of this building. So if we summarize, multiple degree of freedom systems have several natural frequencies and several associated mode shapes. These mode shapes are important because they have a physical meaning, they represent the shape of the motion if you excite the structure at the specific natural frequency, but they also have a mathematical use. They can be used to decouple the equations of motions in a set of in n independent equations of a single degree of freedom system. Then we can just look at all the tools we have developed for computing the response of one degree of freedom systems and the combinations of these different systems will give us the response of the multiple DOF system.